Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us with our worship service. This is the worship service for the First Presbyterian Church of Cody, Wyoming. And this is the service being recorded for Sunday, July 19th. Uh, as we get started, there are a few announcements we want to share with everybody. First of all, immediately after the July 19th morning worship service, those who wish will gather at the church, take a sack lunch, and proceed on up the North Fork where, where we will do our section of the highway for the highway cleanup. Uh, so that is after worship on Sunday the 19th, leaving from the church. I uh, hope you can join us with that. Then next Saturday, Friday the 24th at 1.30, there will be a graveside service for Tony Bork. Tony passed away a month or two ago, and um, Audrey has finally been able to arrange for a service. And so that service will be at the Riverside Cemetery graveside at 1.30, on Friday the 24th, and if you'd like to join us, we'd love to have you there. Uh, we are going to be doing a new member class. We're going to start by gathering next Saturday on the 25th at 9 a.m. at my place, and we'll have a uh, accompanying directions for how to get to my place will be posted on uh, along with this website, and we'd love to see you there. If that date, if you want to join the new member class, but that date doesn't work for you, please stay in touch with us. We're simply going to do that to get it done for those who can be there. And then we'll have another offering if we need to, to uh, have that available for other people. Another announcement, uh, our deacons do a program called Chuck Wagon Meals, where people prepare meals and then they portion it and the deacons take it to homes where people are homebound and they could use some more meals. So if you're one of the folks who regularly cooks for the Chuck Wagon Meal Service, if you could uh, prepare some food and bring it in, that'd be a real help. Some of you have containers that, are, that have been brought back from that and if you want to come to the church kitchen and look, I'm sure you might find some of your containers that have been cleaned up there. And one other note related to that, people used to bring those meals and put them in the freezer that was south of the kitchen, uh, I'm sorry, in the closet, in the freezer in the closet that is south of the kitchen. And that closet has been repurposed. That's now the uh, the workspace for food for kids. So if you're bringing meals for the chuck wagon meals, the, ref the freezer to receive those meals is in the closet off of Buswell Hall. And of course, if you stop at the church office, they can give you further information about that. So for those of you who help with that chuck wagon meal program, that's wonderful. Also, we've had uh, some requests by people who are tired of watching the video service and would like to join the live service that we do on Sunday morning, but still feel a little iffy about mingling with others as the incidence of coronavirus does increase in the community. Another option for you is to come to that live service, remain in your vehicle, and you can tune into that service while you're sitting in your vehicle uh, as a radio broadcast on FM channel 107.9. Now you have to be fairly close to the church building for that to work, so you really have to be here in the parking lot if you want to take advantage of that. But that's one way to get a little closer back to being in a, being present with the rest of the congregation during a service rather than staying at home. I know some of you are looking for no excuse to leave home because you like sitting there in your uh, PJs and uh, watching the service online and that's still fine, but this is one more option for you. Uh, thank you for paying attention to those announcements and uh, we'll turn to our worship service now. Okay. 
Please join me now in our responsive call to worship. It is uh, going to be shown on your screens. I'll lead using the words in lighter print. If you'd please join in reading the words in darker print. Let us pray. God has searched us and known us. God knows when we sit down and when we rise up. God searches out our path and our lying down. God is acquainted with all our ways. Before a word is on our tongues, God knows it. God's hand is ever available to guide us. Such knowledge is a wonder to us. It is beyond anything we can attain. We cannot escape from God's Spirit. There is nowhere to flee from God's presence. Darkness is as light to our God. God illuminates the way before us. Let's join together now in prayer. Almighty God, search us and know our hearts. Test us and know our thoughts. We gather today with eager longing to know you and to be known by you. We want to live as your beloved children. So assure us in these moments that you hear our prayers even as your will is revealed to us. Fill our sleeping and waking hours with your hope. May every time of encounter move us to awe and worship. Lead us in your way. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please join me now as we join together in our unison prayer of confession. Alert us now, eternal spirit, to your presence among us in this place. Together we confess that we have been busy with so many things that we've often forgotten you. We have made little gods out of buildings and furnishings and programs. Sometimes our pet beliefs and interpretations have been all-consuming as we do battle to correct others and presume to defend you. We have forgotten that your love is stronger than any force on earth. Forgive our mistrust of its power and draw us back into the company of disciples who are learning and growing in love. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Please take a moment now of silent confession before God. Amen. It is so easy for us, it is so common for us to presume that what we believe and what we do is right and to look judgmentally on other people and what they do as wrong. And when we do that, 
we get crosswise with God. The parable we're going to be focusing on today is called the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds. And it talks of weeds that represent evil being sown and mixed in with good grain, which is wheat. And it talks about how good, well-intended people can go out into that field and do more harm than good by trying to presume to take on themselves the right to root out the evil that they see in others. The message of Christ proposes a very different way. It proposes a way in which we look deep within ourselves and we recognize and we seek to root out the evil that is within us. And we recognize it and we lift it up and we turn away from it. And we seek the grace and the forgiveness that God makes available, has already made available in the person of Jesus Christ. Instead of looking at and judging other people, we look within and we start from a position of honesty. Then we can know true forgiveness. And then, instead of going about the business of judging other people, we can go about the business of offering grace to and forgiving other people. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please join together now in the Gloria. On Sunday mornings, we have reintroduced the idea of a children's message. And I just thought if you're watching at home, you might try to do the children's message at home. Uh, let's pretend that the youngest one in the room is the child and the other one can do this. How's that? The children's message would have us do a very simple thing. It would have us take out, if we have one at home, a piece of high quality gold jewelry. And let's hold up next to that a piece of imitation gold jewelry. And let's hold it well back from our eyes so that we can see it in a general sense, but we can't examine it closely. And let's ask ourselves, how do we distinguish the high quality gold jewelry from the imitation jewelry? And the, the, the honest answer is at times, unless we know the difference, we can't especially if we can't examine it closely. That becomes an analogy for a parable, the parable we're going to be reading here in a few minutes, about how the men in the parable couldn't distinguish the wheat from the weeds. And even when they could, they couldn't separate them without doing harm. There are things in this life that that appear the same to us. But as time goes by, one becomes evident to be not a good thing and the other becomes evident to be a good thing. And there are times we can address that and separate those out and pursue the good things. But there are also times when our presumptuousness causes us to do more harm than good as we seek to take it upon ourselves to separate the wheat from the weeds. So that might be an analogy you can talk about with your children as you seek to discuss further today's gospel lesson. Thank you. If you've been worshiping with us for the past few weeks, actually for most of the summer, we have been working our way through Matthew's gospel. And today's lesson is a continuation immediately on the heels of last week's lesson. And, and it's tied together. If you were a part of worship last week, we had Jesus talking about why he taught in parables. And in the course of telling the disciples why he taught in parables, he said it was to, 
to nudge them to consider things in a different light, to nudge them towards uh, the possibility that maybe they have something new to learn. And then he follows that with this parable, Matthew chapter 13, beginning with the 24th verse. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. A few verses later, starting in verse 36, Jesus explains that parable. Then he left the crowd and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will weed out of His kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. That ends our gospel lesson for this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, it's so easy for us to be judgmental of others. And it's so easy for us to think that whatever we're up to is right and what other people are doing very likely is wrong. And yet you confront us with a parable today that forces us to, that forces us to consider who we are and whether we have any right to be judging of others and whether, whether we need to always take matters into our own hands or whether we need to learn to trust in you just a little bit more. As we ponder your word, as you confront us with difficult questions, open our ears and let us hear your truth and your word and help us to come to some conclusions and some understandings that help us to live as your faithful people in this time and in this place. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Last Sunday, we focused on Jesus telling his disciples why he taught using parables and stories. He said it was because parables had an ability to speak to a complex or contentious issue and and create an awareness, present the story in a, in a different light. He said often a parable can create as many questions as it answers, but that the purpose of a parable is ultimately to make us think, to open our eyes, and to nudge us to truths that we thus far may not have seen. I believe that today's parable is one of the very most important in the Bible, Yet it may also be one of the most undervalued parables of Jesus, which is sad because it speaks to so much that is happening in our world today. Why is it overlooked? Because it forces us to question our own rightness and our own judgments of others. It forces us to consider that many of the judgments we make 
are God's realm and not ours. It's the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And if we're going to talk about it technically, in the Greek of the New Testament, we have to translate the word that in Greek is zizania, Z-I-Z-A-N-A-I. It isn't the generic term for weeds. It's specific. It's a specific type of weed. It's what we would call today darnel, which is kind of like a, uh, a wild wheat. Um, uh, Zizania is a weed that looks just like a wheat as it is growing up. You can hardly tell the difference between it and the wheat until it starts to head out. We call it darnel. It looks like wheat. It appears like wheat, but it's not wheat. It fools you. It's kind of like wild oats and, and true oats. They look alike, but they're very different. In addition, Darnell is toxic. If you eat it, it will make you sick. So that being said, a farmer sows good seed. An enemy comes by night and sows the, the wheat weeds among the wheat. It goes unnoticed for a while until the wheat starts to head out. And when that happens, the farmer's servants come to him and they bring it to his attention. And in a pre-herbicide era, they suggest pulling the weeds to be rid of them. The master says no. He says between trampling the crop as they move through it and the way the roots of the crop will be torn up as they uproot the weeds, they will do more harm than good if they try to pull the weeds just then. So he says no. Even though the weeds aren't good for the crop, leave them be. And when the crop is mature, then we will pull the weeds and we'll throw them into the furnace to burn and we'll harvest the crop and put it in the bin. This story and Jesus' interpretation of it come with some assumptions. It assumes there is good and there is evil. It assumes that eventually, in the fullness of time, there's a day of reckoning. It assumes that sometimes it takes a spell for us to distinguish the evil from the good or the good from the evil. It assumes that sometimes, and in reality, more often than we like, good and evil have to coexist. It assumes that despite what we think, often our best efforts to root out evil do more harm than good. As a result, it assumes that much of judgment is God's domain and not ours. I'm going to read a quick list of popular books or movies that all share some of the same underlying theme. The Godfather, Sweeney Todd, let me get my list going here, Cape Fear, Hamlet, 9 to 5, Kill Bill, John Wick, all of the Clint Eastwood Dirty Harry movies and Spaghetti Westerns and the outlaw Josie Wales. Easily 70% of Louis L'Amour's books. The Princess Bride, Moby Dick, Gladiator, The Count of Monte Cristo, The Brave One, Braveheart, Django, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, Unforgiven, The Punisher, True Grit, Mad Max. I guarantee all of you has watched at least one of those movies. All of these stories and countless more have an element of people who feel they have been on the receiving end of a great wrong, who take matters into their own hands to attain justice. It is perhaps the single most common theme in American literature and entertainment. And in this parable, Jesus questions this theme, this tendency in our thinking, which is so near and dear to us, which is so central to our literature and our entertainment, that especially as Americans, we cling to and that holds such a formative place in our American ethos. This parable wants us to consider, does this way of thinking frequently lead to doing more harm than good. But all of those stories are fiction. How is this parable applicable in real life? 
Once again, the examples are countless. Think of presidential elections. For speculation's sake, let's imagine that Hillary Clinton won the last presidential election. You know as well as I do that had she won the election, the opposition would have felt that a great wrong had occurred and that the last three years would have been filled with countless legal challenges for everything from Benghazi to using non-secure email servers as Secretary of State to selling access to the Secretary of State's office to large donors of the Clinton Foundation, to name just a few. But we all know she didn't win the election. As we know, Donald Trump won the election. So instead of those legal challenges I just named, We've had three years of Mueller investigations and probes into Russian influence of the election and hush money payments to former mistresses and access Hollywood tapes and investigations into contributions for the inauguration celebration by real estate interests and securities and investment companies looking for favors. We've had investigations into misuse of funds by the Trump Foundation and court action for the release of his tax records, again, just to name a few. I'm not advocating for or against either of these people. My own belief is that in reality, they each have enough dirty laundry to clothe a good-sized third world country. The point is that each legal group, or rather each group, feels that the other has done a great evil. And they resolve to use any means, legal or illegal, to root out the wrong that was done at all costs. And in the process, they wreak havoc on the nation and they undermine the confidence that we might have in our form of government. And sometimes on the national stage, they turn our nation into a joke. Often the evils that they seek to root out are very real. But more harm than good is done in their zealous efforts to get what they want at any cost. Not to mention that many billions of dollars are frittered away on these never-ending investigations and charges. And there certainly is no concept that even if evil was done, that there is a God and that in the fullness of time, in the final harvest, God will sort it out and true justice will be accomplished. Another very simple example. I knew a man who worked most of his life on a ranch, earning a, a small but livable income, the, the wages that he had agreed to work for. As time went on, the old rancher who owned the place said that when he died, the young, young ranch hand would have a share of the ranch. But the old rancher never took the legal steps necessary to make that happen. So when the rancher died, his family felt no obligation to share the estate with the hired man. The hired man spent the rest of his life bitter over that situation, using all of his remaining time and energy and limited resources, fighting a legal battle that he would never win. And although there was a real injustice in what happened to him, his efforts to get what he felt was due to him did him far more harm than good, creating a a growing bitterness that marked his remaining years. And even though he thought of himself as a man of faith, he could not let go and trust that if a great wrong did indeed take place, God's justice would prevail in the end in the final harvest. Another example, we are currently witnessing in our nation a growing awareness and receptivity to change for minority people. Most feel that addressing such long-standing injustices is way overdue. But one can't help but see the difference between many of these minority folks, those who celebrate new advances in equality and who continue to work for and celebrate a more just and equitable world for all people, no matter what their race or their ethnicity, we can't help but notice a difference between those folks and those who are simply so embittered by past wrongs that for them there can never be enough 
change to lead to a harmonious coexistence with people of other races. So even though there is progress and at least some vindication for their long-fought battle, their battle for civil rights up to now has done them more harm than good, leaving them embittered and filled with an insatiable anger that eats them up inside. They cannot see that at some point to experience the peace that Christ would have us know, they will have to learn to let go of past wrongs and trust that any judgment that still needs to be meted out falls into God's purview and not their own purview. In law enforcement, many good officers who fight against criminal elements every day become worn down by a system that is rightfully designed to preserve the individual rights of citizens. At times, those good protections allow criminal behavior and sometimes evil, evil behavior to go unaddressed. It's a fact of life. And more than one good officer has succumbed to their desire to go outside the law to plant evidence or commit perjury or to abuse a suspect in their efforts to root out what he or she believes to be evil. And in the process, they do more harm than good to what they claim to serve to themselves and to the people and the institutions they serve. In Jesus' day, his greatest conflicts were with the entrenched religious culture. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, and the temple priest. They had this faith thing down to a science that worked in their favor, and they didn't need some young upstart coming along and upsetting their profitable apple cart. Our religious communities and leaders are as subject to the same entrenched thinking and personal conviction of rightness as any of the religious leaders in Jesus' day. I've been doing this church thing for a really long time, and I've sat in on more than one backroom deal that had everything to do with politics and factions and little to do with the love of Christ. Church governments at every level, including our own Presbyterian Church USA government, become so fixated on advancing some desire of those in power that they use political means to broker deals and advance agendas that would be right at home on Pennsylvania Avenue, with little thought given to collateral damage that they inflict in their blind pursuit of their own objectives. Self-righteously, wars of attrition are launched with little concern that as they defeat one injustice, they create new injustices that are more politically acceptable at the time, doing as much harm as good because they're unwilling to trust in God's justice to assert itself in the fullness of time. Not because they're so bad, but because they're so human. And as humans, like all of us, they want what they want and they want it now. So they use their positions of power to bring about the outcomes acceptable to them instead of trusting in a God who assures us of a true justice in the fullness of time. I caught the tail end of the final Hunger Games movie the other day in which the main character comes to the ugly realization that in helping to knock one tyrant out of power, she has just helped to put the next tyrant in control. Jesus tells this parable of the wheat and the darnel. And then he stops and he looks carefully at his disciples and you can just see him giving them the look before he points his finger and says, are you listening? Are you really listening? And the implication is that if you are really listening, you suddenly have to start questioning some of your most basic assumptions for almost every aspect of life. 
And in this passage, the biggest question is, when it comes to us assuming that we are good and us and our efforts to overcome evil, who do we place the most trust in? God and his ways or ourselves and the ways of this world? I don't believe Jesus is criticizing the need for rightful governments to keep order and enforce just laws. I don't believe he's criticizing the idea of a legitimate government trying to maintain law and order within its borders or exercise good policy beyond its borders. But even with duly elected governments, we know that there's enough brokenness in all governmental systems because they're made up of people. And we are all broken as well. I don't believe Jesus is talking against individuals standing up to a bully. But he does want us to ponder, how do we stand up to bullies without becoming the bullies ourselves? How do we combat evil without becoming evil ourselves? How do we take it upon ourselves to be the puller of weeds when we cannot do so without harming the good? Can we fight for the values of God's kingdom by embracing the values and the methods of this world? If you don't recall, some easy examples of that would be the Crusades, the Inquisition, and the wars that went throughout Europe in the name of the Reformation. Not necessarily Christianity's finest hours. When does attempting to defeat evil, utilizing the ways of the world, simply result in doing more harm than good? How does our nation become a superpower without becoming the biggest bully on the block? Think of the young men and women who joined the service in the wake of great evils like Pearl Harbor and 9-11, only to discover that, in fact, their efforts to set right the great wrongs of the world, in them they found themselves sucked into equally questionable actions, confronted with the possibility that despite their best intentions, suddenly they were involved with doing as much harm as good, who after their service rightly questioned the legitimacy of some of the things they were called upon to do and carried the wounds of those realities in PTSD and substance abuse and broken relationships for the rest of their lives. Who, at the end of the day, wanting nothing more than to terminate their service, go home and be left alone, to strive their best to live quiet and just and peaceful lives, free of the corrupt values and mixed motives of the ideals that they served. Who learned the hard way that sometimes in trying to root out evil, we do as much harm as good. In whatever we do, how do we do it without doing more harm than good? And to be honest, is our passion to defeat evil and set things right more about us wanting to have things the way we think they ought to be here and now? so that we get what we want when we want it? Or is that simply a lack of confidence, a lack of trust, if you will, that God can and will right that which is wrong in the fullness of time? Often the evil we see and recognize in the world around us is a true evil. But how often are our efforts to root it out wise and well-considered? And how often do our efforts actually end up doing more harm than good? Well, we started this message by, by pointing out that just a few verses before this passage, Jesus tells the disciples that he teaches in parables to nudge us toward receptive insight to engender a readiness and a curiosity that leaves people open to a new way of thinking, a new truth, especially if their entrenched thinking has made them close-minded 
to an essential truth. These stories of Jesus often leave us with more questions than answers. But that's good because his stated goal is to make us think and to help us consider things from a God's eye point of view instead of simply being driven by our own wants and our own desires. And if that's the goal, to make us think, well, then today's story of the wheat and the weeds is a roaring success. Let us pray. Almighty God, we live in a very complex world that has values that are radically different than yours. And we, this is the world we live in, and this, these are the, the realities we deal with. But so often, because we are successful in this world, we confuse the, the values of this world with your values. And we think we're doing the right thing, often without considering your wisdom and your guidance. Heavenly Father, as we look at the world around us, help us to look deeper. Help us to consider the consequences of our actions and our words and the ideals we claim to advocate. Help us when we look upon situations that we see when we see clear evil. Help us to work against that evil. Help us to do all that is in our power to defeat it. But help us to be wise enough to realize that much of what we see is beyond our ability alone to change. And when that happens, help us to persist in doing good and walking by the values of your kingdom. And help us to have the patience we need to hang on for that final day when your justice and your judgment asserts itself. Because, number one, we, we're sick and tired of a lot of the evil we see, and we want to see it defeated. But number two, we're often confused by what we see going on in the world around us because at a certain time and in certain situations, frankly, we profit from it. And it makes our lives easier according to the ways of the world. So help us to distinguish the difference between those things. Help us to, help us to be humble enough to realize without your wisdom and without your guidance, well, we're prone to going down the wrong path ourselves. As we look upon our world and as we see great injustice, Help us to join in efforts to lift up the values of your kingdom and to not get sucked into the evil of this world. We pray also today for those who are struggling in other ways. We pray for those who struggle with ailments in their bodies, in their minds, in their spirits. In our congregation right now, we have a number of folks who are drawing to the end of long lives, and, and it's hard. It's hard as they decline, and it's hard as they, well, as they face death in the near future. Be with them. Assure them of your presence. Comfort them. Walk alongside of their families and help them to know of your abiding presence. And help them to have confidence in the faith that they have long held. That these lives are but a temporary condition and that we live towards an eternal life with you. We pray for those whose ailments are just a nuisance or who live daily with pain that's chronic and it wears them down. Or for those who are constantly struggling with mental illness or mental confusion or just bad thoughts. Help them to find a focus in your grace and in your better ways 
and help them to focus on that in a way that, that eases the challenges they face each day. We pray for those who struggle with addictions and obsessions. We pray for those who are simply lost and wandering and have no clear direction in their lives, have no sense that some behaviors and activities clearly are evil and wrong and lead them in bad ways and, and who do not have a set of good values that they can cling to, that can guide them as they seek to live these lives. For those without faith in you, help them, even on winding paths, to find their way. And help us, as we live in relationship to them, to be graceful and patient and helpful and, when called upon, to assist so that we might help the lost and the wandering to discover the same goodness in you that we have found. We ask that you would watch over and be with the leaders of our world, with our national leaders, with our elected officials, with the judges in the Supreme Court, with our state and local officials. We ask for your guidance upon them at all times, but especially at this confusing national time of national illness. We pray that people might become a little more compassionate and a little more thoughtful and a little more patient and a little more considerate of others. I think if we all did that together for a month or two, this would all be behind us. So help us to not buy into the political arguments and all the ranting and raving and help us to simply center ourselves in you and be led by you into the lives you would have us to lead. We pray all of this in Christ's name, remembering now how he taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Wheat and weeds. We, we like to think we know good from evil, and, and in many cases we do. I'm not trying to imply we don't. But there's a lot of different voices in the world around us. There are voices that would suggest there is no true good and there is no true evil. There are equally loud voices that say that we know exactly what is good and exactly what is evil and we presume to be the judge of those who are different than ourselves, often to their detriment or our detriment, often making choices that do not reflect the grace of Christ in any way. It's a confusing world, and it's a confusing time and a confusing place. But we do well to remember that if we claim to follow the ways of Christ, those ways are uniquely different than the ways of our world. So we have to we have to allow ourselves to be drawn into his stories. And we have to ponder the dynamics that he says are important for us to ponder. And even if that challenges some sacred thing of our own, we have to be willing to go there because these lives of faith are not about preserving our cherished ideals. They're about knowing more clearly and drawing more closely to the person we have come to know as Jesus the Christ. So to help us in that end, as we leave our places of worship right now, the presence of God promises to go with us. If we take with us the love of God, the grace that is most clearly seen in the person of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and the hope and the joy and the encouragement and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. If we allow these aspects of God to be our constant companion as we go through life, we have the wisdom and the guidance we need for navigating life's trials. So never be afraid of the questions, even if those questions lead you to conclusions that you don't like. Enter into the stories of Jesus Allow them to lead you, to nudge you into newer and greater understandings. And know that that's a good thing. That's the source of finding the peace of Christ. As you go from this place, go into the world and share with others the same grace that God has shared with you, just as generously as God has shared it with you and very good things will happen. Go in peace. Amen.